Good morning. That was pretty good. Welcome to Forest Presbyterian Church, where we're living God's heart, hands, and voice. Um, this week, Pastor Morgan is gone. He, Gwen, and Brendan flew out yesterday to California, where Brendan is competing at the uh, Speed USA Speedo National Championships, Junior Championships, where he is, I think most people have been following him. He is ranked. So they start swimming tomorrow if you go look on the web. If anybody is new and doesn't know about their son, we all have adopted children into the family. And they have been doing that. There might be. Yeah, he, he was the uh, local swimmer of the year, male swimmer of the year. Um, so... Okay, um, so we are, we do have Reverend Sean Hiska with us here today, and he is both an accountant and a pastor, which is an interesting combination, Sean, very interesting. Um, so he uh, serves the senior living nonprofit, Human Good, as their assistant controller. They're actually based out of Philadelphia, um, but he is, works remote, so we are blessed to have him here. And he is a minister member at large for Presbyterian of the Peaks. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Okay, we've got one announcement. Okay. Hi, I'm Laura Collier with Missions. I want to um, say thank you for all the school supplies that was donated. Today was the last day to give, and there's a lot of supplies out there. So all those supplies will ensure a child in Beaufort County starts their year off with success. Also, today is two cents a meal. Please give generously. And last, um, Shepherd's Table at Beaufort Christian Ministries provides a hot meal the third Friday of every month and they need desserts. They prepare a meal to feed about 110 people, um, and the dessert can be cookies, um, homemade. I actually work full time, so I bought individual wrapped um, little Debbie cakes, um, and food is very expensive right now, so maybe if you wanna do it as a buddy, get a buddy to, together y'all can come up with 110 desserts. Um, we need desserts for September, October, November, and December. We're covered through August. Um, so if you are interested in, in providing a dessert, see myself or Jenny or reach out to Morgan. Thank you. Okay, let us op open worship with the prelude.
please stand if you're able and join me in the call to worship. God has given us this day. God's steadfast love endures forever. God has gathered us in this place. There are many places we could be, but God has brought us here. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let us pray. O oh, sovereign God, in Jesus Christ, you set your holy reign upon this earth and within your people. So let its coming be like the mustard seed that grows into greatness and like the leaven that mixes with the grain until the whole becomes greater. To the praise of the triune God who lives forevermore. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing hymn number 401 here in this place.
be seated. Remember that our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us in our weakness, since in every respect he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us with boldness approach the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Faithful God, we confess our faithlessness. Our hearts are fickle, our eyes wander, and we trick ourselves into serving other gods. We speak lies, accept lies, live lies, destroying others and ourselves along the way. Forgive our waywardness and lead us back to you. Embolden our trust in your faithfulness and settle your truth in our hearts. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. standing as we sing hymn number 318, In Christ There Is No East or West. First reading comes from the Old Testament, 
Psalm 49, verses 1 through 12. Hear the word of the Lord. Hear this, all you peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the harp. Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of my persecutors surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches? Truly, no ransom avails for one's life. There is no price one can give to God for it. For the ransom of life is costly and can never suffice that one should live on forever and never see the grave. When we look at the wise, they die. Fool and dolt perish together and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations, though they name lands their own. Mortals cannot abide in their pomp. They are like the animals that perish. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
I'd like now to invite any children that are here to come forward and to help ensure we have a full uh, gathering up here. I also want to invite anyone who feels young at heart. Please come on up and let's gather together. Oh, come on. <laughs> awesome, all right, cool. Hey guys, how are you today? All right, question for you. What do you think this is? Lots of cookies. Cookies. Well, cookies were in there. Cookies, wow, you're really smart because it feels pretty empty. And look, I brought an empty cookie jar today. Someone dared me to do it on Facebook, so I did it. So, <laughs> But I did, didn't come unprepared. Last night I baked this whole tray of chocolate chip cookies. Yeah. Now who wants to come up? Now who wants to come up, huh? <laughs> <laughs> So, question for you guys. Do you think all these cookies are going to fit in this tin? I can close the lid. No. Do you dare me to try? Yeah. No? Okay. So, hey, I'm, I'm going to have you guys take a cookie first, all right? But don't eat it yet. You can have it later. Yeah. Oh, this is the big cookie. Yeah, if you want a bigger one, you can take it. Oh, there you go. So, so, I have a problem now. I have all these chocolate chip cookies, and I have this small tin. What do you think I should do? Keep them that. Okay, that's one idea. Any other ideas? Hand them out. Hand them out. That is a good idea. So what, should I just get a bigger tin so I can keep them for myself? Yes. I could, yes. But the answer I was looking for was to hand them out. Today we're going to read a story, a parable that Jesus tells his disciples about a man who had this crop who had a field and he produced this harvest. I don't know what it was. It could have been cookies, probably wasn't. But it, <laughs> it was maybe wheat or corn or who, whatever it was. And he had such a bountiful crop, the storage bin he had weren't big enough. So what did he do? Did he give it to people? Yes, I think. Unfortunately, no, he didn't. He decided to tear down his barns and build even bigger ones to store them, to store all this food just for himself. And Jesus teaches the disciples and says, that is the wrong way to think, because we need to be rich towards God and not ourselves. And by doing so, to offer all of what we have to everyone else. So, because we have this bountiful harvest of chocolate chip cookies, because that is very scriptural, <laughs> uh, I'm going to fill this tin, and I want to ask you guys to be my helpers. Because... We can hand these out. Do you guys, anyone in here want a chocolate chip cookie? No? no? Oh, okay. Raise your hand if you want a chocolate chip cookie. Okay. So I'm going to ask you guys, when we're, after we have a prayer, if you don't mind, handing out chocolate chip cookies to everyone in the pews. Would you mind doing that? No. No? Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Wow, this is actually really big. So you might have to break this up into chips of two. See, clearly... I made so many cookies, they will not fit in this tin. Good. I was worried about that. So we'll have two different passing out groups. We'll have one with the tin and one with the tray. Just make sure I get the tray back. That's all. So awesome. Well, let us, before you pass them out, let us, let us pray. All right, guys? Join the hands together. Guys, we give thanks to you, O oh Lord. We thank you for all that we have. We thank you for the abundance in our lives the abundance of chocolate chip cookies, of harvest, of things that we possess. God, we ask for you to direct our hearts to use everything that we have, all of who we are, for your glory. Help us to love everyone with everything we own. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Awesome. See, I want to sugar you guys all up before the sermon. See, there was a real <laughs> trick before that. You guys want to help? Thank you guys so much. Cool. There we go. Awesome. Raise your hand if you want a cookie, please, to help people. I'm sure Pastor Morgan doesn't sweeten you guys up before a message, huh? <laughs>
So usually we're passing the offering plates in between pews for people to put something in. This is now we're passing the church's offering plate of cookies out into the pews. Oh, yes, please make sure we, we, we give all the rest of the cookies to the AV Sound Tech guys in the booth because they help us ensure. And these were produced in a nut-free facility with hands that were washed and they're individually wrapped for COVID and cleanliness. Guys, I thank you so much for all your help in delivering. And you can just leave the trays in one of the pews. When you're done, I will find them. You can leave it right there in the front pew. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for your help. Like, I, I, I came to church today not to do work. Come on. But <laughs> this is a free gift. You can just leave them right there, bud. Thank you so much. They're right on the pew. Thank you. A second scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. Listen now for God's word to you. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Saul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. It is a joy to be back here with all of you at Forest Presbyterian Church. The last time I was here, right before Christmas, I believe I had shared the fact that my lovely wife, Sarah, who wasn't able to join me then um, because she wasn't feeling well because she was a few months pregnant. Well, if you do the math correctly there, we are now glad and thrilled to share that we are now proud parents of a beautiful young girl named Eliana Grace, who just turned two uh, two months old the other week. So we are exhausted. Thank you. We are exhausted most days. <laughs> I will have bursts of energy thinking, hey, I got this parent thing down. And then in the middle of the day, I'll be sitting at my computer going, how can I not keep my eyes open? Some of you might just think that looking at a computer screen of Excel and numbers, but I actually get excited about that usually. <laughs> Yet we wouldn't trade a single moment for anything less. So it is just a joy to be back now to share such good news. Good news. That is what we truly desire to hear each Sunday we come to church, particularly the good news of the gospel, the good news of God's saving grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. Each week, us pastors are tasked with the challenge of reading texts and finding through the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what the good news present is in that particular text so that we can hold on to that good news and it can guide us in our lives of faith. And then you have a gospel text like the one we just read. And what a moment for Pastor Morgan to be away when the guest preacher is left to wrestle with an apparent stewardship sermon in the middle of the summer. (laughs) 
I joked with him with this last night, and he just said, amen, brother. And I'm like, thank you, Morgan. I appreciate that. I love following the Revised Common Lectionary. This was not a text I just decided to choose to preach on. This was a Sunday gospel reading in the lectionary that was set in motion decades ago, decades before I was even born, I believe even decades before my parents were even born, so just dating me slightly. And it was set in motion with no connection to the outside real world. But yet, time after time, the lectionary texts speak profound truths to us during times in our world that one can only say was the true work of the Holy Spirit. So here in Luke's Gospel, we have the parable of the rich fool slated to be read on the Sunday immediately following the latest GDP quarterly announcement of how our economy is doing or is not doing a time when scholars are debating, are we actually in a recession? Is it coming? We do have two consecutive quarters of decreasing growth. We've seen inflation hit all of our pocketbooks and wallets, with it being at a 40-year high. And then this past Friday, there was the Mega Millions multi-state lottery at a record high, $1.3 billion. It's in this tough uncertain, and yet crazy economic environment, we are approached with this parable. The parable starts off with yet another abrasive demand of Jesus. In the crowds following Jesus, an unnamed man demands that Jesus force this man's very likely older brother to divide up the family inheritance. Jesus, though, was not going to be a Judge Judy and resolve this dispute amongst these brothers. Instead, he warns this man to be on guard against all kinds of greed. Two weeks ago in the Mary and Martha story, which I believe Pastor Morgan did read with you all, if you remember, Martha demanded Jesus to do something and tell Mary to help her. Both of Martha's demands and the demand of this unnamed man here had warped selfish motives behind them. Both of their demands, in my belief, were precursors to this parable. Parable is a simple story. A rich landowner whose land produces abundant crops had a very bountiful harvest of grain, and he ran out of room of where to store this harvest. And what does one do when one runs out of space of something being grown or built or produced? Why, we obtain a larger storage bin to ensure their safekeeping. When one bakes an overabundant batch of chocolate chip cookies and the small container is too small, what do we do? Well, we need to find more containers or a larger one. When we have acquired more and more clothes in the fall and the winter and now it's 90 degrees with 100% humidity and we don't want to wear those sweatshirts, what do we do? We put them in a storage bin. Oh look, that storage bin's a little too small. Let's go to Home Depot or Lowe's or Target and Walmart to buy what? Yet another storage bin so we can keep those clothes clean. We all do it. We all have done it. I've done it. This is especially true in our American culture, a culture that does value possessions and what we own. Back in February 2021, a few months after Sarah and I got married, we spent a month in Uganda where she was a missionary for 12 years. We went with a prayer and discernment of how God was going to use us together in ministry as husband and wife. We knew we had to take Sarah's belongings out of her prior house, but we weren't exactly sure what God had in store for us yet. Now, if this was America, we would have said, well, let's just pack up everything, go to the nearest self-storage unit, hold everything up, pay a monthly fee, go back home to the States and pray what God has for us here in Uganda, come back, take everything out of the self-storage and move it to the new house. The problem is Uganda doesn't have any self-storage units like this. So we had the hard task of selling most of the items and only bringing back what was absolutely necessary in seven large suitcases and bins traveling across the world. North America, and particularly the United States, leads the world in the number of self-storage facilities. For perspective, 
Most of us probably think there are a million Starbuckses around the country. Every place we look, there's another Starbucks. Every store we go in, there's another Starbucks. Around the country, there are only 15,000 Starbucks locations, either in stores or standalone Starbucks. There are over, almost over 50,000 self-storage facilities, not units, facilities around the country, and it's only growing quicker by the year. We do love and cherish our possessions if we are honest with ourselves. So with this mindset, I think we can resonate with the rich man in this parable, that if the crop we were growing was growing so much, and our current storage bins were too small to hold them all, then we should ensure we have a large enough space to store them. You know, there is scriptural precedence for storing up a harvest that is bountiful. If you remember back in the Old Testament book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 41, when Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream, he tells Pharaoh, well, God is calling you in these years of bountiful harvest to store up the harvest so that when the famine comes, you have enough food to feed the people. So then they set aside portions of those harvests in the years that were good, so that when the years and the famine came, they had food to feed. So the rich man in Jesus' parable was only doing what one logically would do when you run out of space. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Saul, we have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. I mean, who doesn't want a life like that? Where we can just sit back, relax, for we have all the food we could ever need to eat. We're never going to go hungry. We have all the resources we need to drink whatever drink we please. So we relax, we eat, and we drink and be merry. Isn't that our goal in life? Isn't that the true end of our pursuit of happiness in our culture and our world? To produce enough during the years we can. To store it up for ourselves. So when we can no longer work or when we no longer want to work, we have enough to enjoy life and live it to the fullest. Isn't that most of our goals? In some ways, it is mine. I set aside a portion of my salary to a 401k so that I have enough in retirement. I get it. But the problem with this mindset, and thus the problem this rich man had, wasn't in the actual storage of his harvest, but rather where his focus lied and why he was storing it in the first place. This rich man's sole focus was on himself and his own ability. He gave no credit to God, no thanksgiving. The only praise was his own pat on the back for producing such an amazing crop, and zero focus on anyone or anything else. I will say to myself, soul, I could almost see him saying, I say to myself, self, good job. Store it up. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. The major difference between this parable and the story of Joseph interpreting Pharaoh's dream is that the storage of the harvest in Egypt over the seven years of bountiful crops was to ensure that people were fed in the seven years of famine. Those crops were not stored for Pharaoh to eat them himself. As Joel Green wrote in his commentary on the Gospel of Luke, the rich man's solution to the dilemma of abundance also had communal implications. In future times of scarcity, he will become even richer as others will be dependent upon him and the prices he sets for food. This rich man wasn't storing up his harvest to ensure that he could feed his entire village. He didn't tear down his small storage units and build larger ones so he could feed even more people. 
The man gave no credit, no acknowledgement to God for the bountiful harvest. All of his motives, all of his focus was on me, myself, and I. He was lost within his own greed. It resonates with the warning Jesus gave the unmanned, unnamed man at the beginning of our story. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Well then, if our life shouldn't consist in the abundance of possessions, what should our life consist of? I believe if we were to throw that question back at Jesus, he would respond by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself, while also adding, you'll live a life that's rich towards God. What does that mean exactly, to live a life that is rich towards God? Jesus ends the parable with this phrase. He leads us to this deep, discerning, almost commandment-level thought at the end of this parable, but with no practical how-tos. It's similar to a minister gathering a couple together who are about to be married and saying, here's a piece of advice, love each other daily. I mean, that's great advice, right? But how? It sounds simple, but if you unpack it, it gets a little more serious. How do I love my spouse? In what ways should I love them? How best can I show in active ways of love that they desire and resonate with? with. The same is true with our God. How can we act, how can and do we act in ways that are rich towards God? What actions would God consider to be rich? I think we again go back to that greatest commandment that Jesus just answered our question with, one on which the entire law hangs for us. To love the Lord our God and to love our neighbor as ourself. This is truly the core of who we should be and how we should act in all of life's circumstances. When you talk about an abundant harvest, the house that Sarah and I live in, in Garland Hill in downtown Lynchburg, the prior owner planted a fig tree which is now on the side of the house, overgrowing the side, branches extending over the sidewalk into the actual street with so many figs galore, and planted not one but two pear trees, one in the middle of the yard and one close to a fence that also has branches that extend up in every single direction and almost close to the fence. Recently, our security cameras have caught people walking on the street, which is fine, but then reaching over our fence and just grabbing pears from one of the trees. Not a branch that was overhanging the fence into the sidewalk, but literally standing, reaching over to grab a pear and plucking it. Now it's possible this person, we believe might be a fellow neighbor of ours, used to walk by last year before we purchased the house and it was, no one was living in it. And they just, they helped themselves to it last year because no one was doing anything with it. My initial reaction of seeing someone reach over our fence and thus onto our property to take what belongs to us was one of, let's just say, not very kind and loving, full of a little more anger and bitterness. Who do they think they are to just reach over and take what doesn't belong to them? But yet, our harvest of pears and figs are so bountiful, we know personally we will not be able to use all of what we are producing. As both my wife Sarah has challenged me as well as this text. Again, this just happened earlier this week. So you talk about the lectionary text and events in life speaking truth to you in the midst of it if we have our ears open. As this text has challenged me, how do we and how do I in this particular situation continue to live out the character and focus of life I and all of us are called to live out by our Lord Jesus, to have at our core all of, who, all of our feelings, all of our thoughts, all of our actions, that of loving our God and loving our neighbor? How do I do that in this situation? One thought we have is that as the fruit continues to ripen, we just might bundle up some pears and figs 
and drop off some to all of our neighbors with a little note saying, we have an abundant crop. Eat, drink, well not drink, but eat and be merry. Who knows what we will actually do? But what we do know is that we want all of our actions to be that of true, sincere, Jesus-inspired love. This was the ultimate failing of the rich fool in this parable. Not that he had a bountiful harvest, nor the fact that he stored it up for future use, but rather the focus of his harvest and the sole usage of the storage of his harvest was his own self-centered, self-congratulating, self-benefiting focus. The challenge before us in our own personal lives and particularly in the lives for all of our churches, when we think about all of our items and the resources that we possess in life, whether they are physical goods, bountiful harvests, family heirlooms, monetary resources, or resources of skill and knowledge, we must constantly look ourselves in the mirror and ask, how are we benefiting the kingdom of God with what we have and all of who we are? We start with this question, this question that orients our actions and our possessions toward the kingdom, towards serving others, towards serving our God. I'd like to close with this quote from Richard Carlson, who wrote, Life and possessions are a gift of God to be used to advance God's agenda, God's agenda of care and compassion, precisely for those who lack resources to provide for themselves. So I leave you all with this thought to reflect upon in the coming days, weeks, months, and well for the rest of your lives. How are you using the possessions you have? How are you using everything in your lives to advance God's kingdom of care, love, and compassion? This, I believe, is how we start living a life that is rich towards God, where we can relax, eat, drink, and be merry with all of God's creation with us, everyone enjoying the splendor of God's amazing, gracious, life-giving love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand if you're able as we state what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Catholic, Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us now join our hearts and minds together in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we call before you this morning with our hearts that are heavy heavy of the thoughts of those who are sick in our world and particularly in our own lives. Those battling illnesses, whether colds or COVID or life-threatening cancers. God, we ask for your healing and calming presence to be with all of those who are sick. Lord, in these troubling economic times where food prices have shot up 20, 30, 40 percent, it's hard for some people to put food on the table for their families. God, we pray that you will provide for all of us, 
and for those of us who have an abundance to ensure that we share it with those who have less so that all may eat and drink in your kingdom. God, we pray for this world that every day something new happens that tears it further from you. God, we pray for all of the leaders of this world, whether our local leaders here, our state governor and representatives, leaders of this country, and the leaders around the world, that everyone in a position to lead others is guided first and foremost by you, O oh Lord, by you and your word, not their own selfish ambitions. Hear all of these prayers we lift up, those out loud, but also those deep within our hearts, those we share with you, this day and every day. We pray for this church, O oh Lord, and your people within it, that you will inspire them and guide them in their service and their work for you, sharing your love and your gospel message of grace and mercy with the community here. Bless Pastor Morgan and his family as they are away. Bless all who come to know you and trust in your saving grace, O oh Lord. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Let us now continue our worship with the offering of ourselves. we ask for your blessing upon this offering this morning. That the gifts that we have given back will be used and they are blessed by you in the service of this church and living out its calling to follow you and to share your message with this community. Hear this prayer and hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us remain standing and sing our closing hymn, number 716, God Who's Giving Knows No Ending. attention to some of those lyrics. Now direct our daily labor, lest we strive for self alone. That is our call in our life, to not daily labor with all of what we have and all of what we do for ourselves only, but for the kingdom and for God. And that is my charge for all of you in your own daily labors, in your schooling, in your in your work, in your retirements, if you are retired, with all of what you own, all of what you have, all of the treasures we have been entrusted with, to go and use them for the kingdom. Share them with the world, because they are clearly not ours, but our God's. Go now in peace, and may the power of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day, until we meet again. Amen.